Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Harvard ABCD GIS presentation for April 2016. Um, we are delighted to have with us today Heidi Hurst. Heidi is a um, senior here at Harvard College. She is a math concentrator with a geospatial um, focus or I don't think you can call it a minor officially, right? But <laughs> Not officially. anyway, she's done some great work with mapping and GIS, and we're um, happy to have her here. So I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Um, thank you guys so much for coming today. I know the weather is gorgeous outside, and there's probably other things you could be doing with your time. But I appreciate you coming to hear a little bit about my research. Um, I'm studying applied math with a focus in geospatial analysis, which, as I was telling, uh, a girl who came to interview me for the Crimson is the closest you can get to a geography degree here since we uh, don't exactly have a department anymore, but I did my best. So today, um, I realize I'll be preaching to the choir a little bit. This presentation is about why this matters, and given that you're here, you probably already believe that GIS matters and is very important. But hopefully I can give you an example of why that matters in disaster recovery specifically. So just to get a sense of the folks who are in the room, can you raise your hand if you're familiar with disaster recovery, if you've worked in any sort of disaster relief or disaster? a little bit. Um, and can you raise your hand again if you're familiar with ArcPy or using Python for ArcMap? Okay. Thank you. It really helps to just get a sense of, of who all is in the room. So um, I want to talk a little bit about why, why disasters. So obviously disasters matter. Disasters are important. Disasters have huge impacts on people's lives. And they come in many different shapes and forms, which means that the response to disasters also need to come in many shapes and forms. So this is a horse um, fondly known as Socks, who was patiently waiting out a flood in his hometown. Uh, now it looks like Socks is tied up, and this was a conversation that caused quite a bit of controversy in the area of the disaster. But Socks is actually just waiting in an eddy behind the fence post so that he has less resistance from the stream. So responses to disaster take all different types of forms. And over the summer, I worked for FEMA as an intern in the recovery directorate, which focuses not on the immediate aftermath of a discovery, but rather the long-term efforts to get a community back to what's called a new normal. Um, and as one of their interns, I had a lot of freedom to determine what type of project I would be working on and pick an area where I felt like I could really make a tangible difference and learn a lot. So I decided to work with disaster recovery centers. So FEMA, for those of you who don't know, is a federal emergency management agency. One thing that's really important about FEMA specifically is that it requires a collaboration between multiple different levels of government. So FEMA as a federal agency is required to work with state and local agencies and nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations to together come up with a disaster really plan and manage any type of incident that comes up. It means there's a lot of different players and a lot of moving parts, just something to keep in mind as we move forward. So I decided to focus my work on disaster recovery centers. So disaster recovery centers are sort of these pop-up shops that open hopefully a week after a disaster, sometimes a little bit longer, and are open for about three months. And the idea with these locations, they're not where you go if you need food, water, shelter. They're where you go if you need a loan to fix your roof, or information about crisis counseling, or maybe a fridge so that you can keep your medications cool. Um, so it's longer term, again, recovery oriented things. FEMA opens a ton of these facilities. So for one disaster, depending on the size of the disaster, FEMA might open anywhere between zero and 20 disaster recovery centers. Um, and in the five years between 2008 and 2013, over 1 million people visited these centers. So these constitute a non-trivial chunk uh, of the interaction that the public has with FEMA. So um, to talk a little bit about why I decided to choose this project, like I said, I had a lot of leeway coming in. Um, and the most obvious reason I chose this project is because I went up to someone, it was during my first week there, and I said, so how do you decide where to put these? Like, they sound really cool and stuff, but where do you put them? And they said, oh, you know. And I was like, oh, you know, that's my favorite place to put things, of course. Um, so I thought to myself, you know, I like math, I like maps, maybe we can find a way to come up with a little bit more rigorous of a definition of where we should put these things. So. I thought the question was cool and my advisor suggested I work on it, so here we are. So my big question is where should we put these disaster recovery centers? Now my goal going into this was to come up with some sort of code or structure 
whereby you could plug in the inputs that you had, say infrastructure damage, population, et cetera, and it would pop out three or four locations, say put it here. Unfortunately, that tended to be a bigger project than I was able to tackle in the summer. So what you'll see is a small chunk of what I was able to do. So there are a number of challenges in answering this question. First, FEMA has limited resources and minimal frameworks for geospatial analysis. So at least in the recovery directorate where I was working and at FEMA headquarters in DC, there aren't a ton of people who are really well versed in geospatial analysis. And in particular, there aren't many people who are familiar with Python scripting at all. So as I'll talk about throughout this presentation, Python scripting provides a really powerful tool to standardize and expedite these geospatial processes. So instead of going through and clicking bit by bit, you can have it all run as a code and come back 20 minutes later with a beautiful PDF of whatever you ask for, if you know what you're asking for. The next challenge is that DRCs need to be open quickly, as quickly as possible, because you want to give people the resources they need to recover from these disasters as quickly as possible, which means we have to have a pretty good idea of where we're going to put these things before we need to open them. Some places, like Region 1, which includes um, Massachusetts and the rest of New England, has pre-identified a couple of DRC locations. So you can rest assured that if a disaster hits Boston, they'll likely open one of these in your local library. But other places haven't thought this through in advance. And so by having a spatial framework in advance, we can reduce the time and start running these potentially while a hurricane is making landfall. Um, third, DRCs are requested by local authorities. And this is something that I didn't quite understand until I had been there for a while. Um, this came out particularly in Hurricane Sandy and bring up DRCs after that, that every uh, local politician was very um, enthusiastic about having as many DRCs as they could get their hands on for their district, even if that DRC might have been redundant um, or might not have been put in a good location. But it looked good for folks to have DRCs in their district. So there's a bit of tension there that these are federally funded resources that are requested at lower levels. Um, and finally, there's no consistent metric for determining how suitable locations are. So at the time that I was working there, there wasn't a rubric that said, here's what we're really looking for. Instead, I conducted interviews, asked people who had been DRC managers or program managers what they looked for in a site and tried to cobble together something that I felt was effective. So again, what's perhaps most important is the framework. So um, I found an old FEMA SAT memorandum saying that we're supposed to articulate the data that we'll measure to determine whether these are serving their intended purposes. I took that to mean the location and decided that my research had a very important mission. Um, this is what I opened every one of my talks at FEMA with because it made people, they were like, oh, this matters for that memorandum that we forgot about. Um, always, always good to find one of those. So again, my idea was simply to find a framework. I'm not saying this is the best way to allocate DRCs. I'm not saying this is the most efficient. But this at least gives us a baseline to start with so that we can build in other variables as that information becomes either available or is proved to be more relevant. So my approach was to focus on the social vulnerability index, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. But I had to pick some sort of variable, so I decided to pick that. Um, and I wanted to give ac accurate population estimates for DRC catchments to figure out how many people are we really talking about. Not only how many people have been affected, but how many people can make it to these disaster recovery centers. And finally, my goal was to leave the folks at FEMA with a comprehensive script that they could then run after I was gone. So to talk a bit about the Social Vulnerability Index. Um, the Social Vulnerability Index was developed in 2001, a paper that came out in the Journal of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. It was simply a way of combining census variables to understand what groups of people or what areas are more or less able to, as this quote says, prevent human suffering or financial loss in the event of a disaster. Um, so there are a ton of different variables that fall into this category. So for example, if people don't have access to a car, it's gonna be harder for them to evacuate. It's gonna be harder for them to get help. If people can't speak English, it might be harder for them to accept help from people who come around. So a number of different factors that all go into this. One thing that I was struck by in reading the paper in which this was first proposed was a quote that I'm going to read verbatim. Um, quote, all people are made up of a constellation of characteristics that enable them to assist in some situations, but require assistance in others. None should be viewed merely as a so-called victim group or so-called rescue group. So as I talk about social vulnerability, we're not just worried about the most vulnerable people. 
we're worried about everyone that is impacted by this disaster. But particular populations might have particular vulnerabilities that need to be paid attention to. Does anybody have any questions on social vulnerability before I continue on? Okay. It's a pretty like nifty idea, and I think it's really starting to get traction in disaster management. How is it, like, it takes into account the 14 census variables, mm -hmm. just like an average good Right now, it's sort of curated by the CDC, and they use um, percentile measures, and then combine them. I think it might be a weighted average measure. So this is agreed upon formula of saying you can take variables and combine them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this isn't something that I, I had the wherewithal to concoct myself. The, the origin, you said CDC is. Mm -hmm. Um, it's by census tract. Yeah. So does this give uh, us like one number for a community or on disaster? Mm, that's a good question. So it's for a community regardless of disaster. So that means that if you're looking at different disasters, you might want to look at different variables. And I looked at the overall vulnerability, but you could look at, again, it breaks it into four different categories. Socioeconomic status, household composition, race, ethnicity, language, and housing transportation. If you're looking at planning evacuation routes or something, you might want to look at housing transportation. If you're looking at distributing information, you might want to look at race, ethnicity, and language. Um, so it depends. I looked at overall. That's a good question. So to give you a sense of where I'm going with this, I'm going to show you the end, and then I'm going to walk you through how we got there so you don't get don't get lost in the, in the maps. So one of the outputs is this sort of breakdown by vulnerability. Uh, and the different shading in each box or in each pie chart corresponds to how far away these people are from home. So we see in the high vulnerability population, about half of people are within 20 minutes drive of a TRC. That's pretty good. So these are the people who are most in need of support. These are the elderly, the disabled people who don't speak English, people who don't have internet, can get to a TRC within a 20 minute time. This is so, where it's so this is taking start locations of TRCs. That's a great question. So this is for a specific disaster, and I'll go through that in just a second. Um, yeah. So I would be remiss if I didn't give a nod to the types of data that I used. Um, I used some internal data from FEMA, being the counties and the DRC locations, which I pulled from arrest service, and external data, SBI from the CDC, landscape data, which is so cool, um, and a couple of other like data sources. Um, so here's how we went about this. So there are four primary steps. The first step is to determine the catchment area of the DRC using network analyst. The second is to categorize population characteristics, and that's the social vulnerability that I talked about. Third is to analyze what populations are being served. And then the final step is to visualize these results in a way that makes sense for whoever's interpreting the data. So to answer your question um, about the time span, this is for disaster 4223, um, which occurred in Texas last summer. May and June, Texas received an inordinate amount of rain. You probably remember hearing about this. Um, lots of things got washed away. Everything was flooded. Um, and I chose this disaster for a couple of reasons. First, I chose it because it was happening while I was there. So it felt very relevant, and I was able to use active DRC locations to make these estimates. Um, second, Texas gets flooded a lot. So this is not an uncommon type of disaster. This disaster combination in particular, severe storms, tornadoes, straight line winds, and flooding, is the most common disaster designation that FEMA has had in the last 20 years, um, which is interesting. So it's a pretty representative example. I also chose this because it's a pretty rural community. And as a caveat, this process that I'll be discussing works mostly for rural communities. It doesn't work very well if you have to talk about like, Hurricane Sandy and using public transit to get there and stuff. It's sort of a wash for that because it's based on drive times. So the first step is catchment areas. So I'll show a slide next of what these actually look like but to walk you through the process and if this gets overly technical i'm not interested in being maybe creating just stop me and we can carry on i'm really excited for that exact reason because i've talked to other folks about this research who aren't gis specialists so i hope you guys can push back and give me feedback on the gis bits of it um, so for this i pulled the drc locations from a FEMA internal rest service and then use the network analyst to determine the drive time catchments so this is drive time to facility, um, and I picked 20, 40, and 60 sort of arbitrarily. Were I to do this again, 
I would want to make sure that I had a reason why I chose those breakpoints. But I chose them for convenience and after talking to folks about what had proved effective in the past. So one reason that I decided to use Network Analyst, besides the fact that it's obviously really cool, um, is that you can include infrastructure impedances. And when you're talking about disaster relief and recovery efforts, infrastructure impedances are absolutely crucial to consider. So take, for example, the 2013 Colorado floods. Huge floods, washed away a bunch of rivers. There's a lot of small communities in the canyons in Colorado that if your bridge is washed out, they have to get airlifted out. It was the largest use of uh, helicopters in a civilian operation since Hurricane Katrina. But if you put a DRC just down the road, just down the road might not work if the bridge is washed out. So this is sort of as available, but if you can include the infrastructure damage, you can really get a better picture of what the landscape is like for survivors. Um, and finally, once I ran the network analysis and had these beautiful catchment areas for all of my DRCs, I converted it into a raster. And I'll talk about why I did that later. Um, but I did it so I could combine it with other variables. There's probably a better way to do that, but I don't know. So, so here's what that map looked like. Um, the blue pentagons are mobile DRCs. These are sort of like little trailers that you can drive around, set up in a community for a couple of days. Uh, the black triangles, which are very difficult to see, but are surrounded by white areas that are fixed DRCs. So these are oftentimes opened in gyms, in libraries, in convention centers. The counties that are this like beige color were not declared for this disaster. So the counties that you're seeing are the counties that were declared. Are there any questions about this map? This is my map. Yeah. So the light white areas show a 20 minute drive time. Um, then. Do you have a template that you uh, use all your maps into? Yeah. Or? Um, I'm modified in the existing FEMA template. Yeah, one thing that I think FEMA um, and a number of different agencies are working on now is creating standard outputs. So. We know a hurricane is coming. These are the six maps that we want that are going to give us the best information. And so one of my hopes was to at least get the ball rolling on what type of standard outputs could be most effective in looking at DRCs. I feel like you have a question. Yes. So you made, you made a, um, a model for that. That was the whole. And are you going to explain how you Yeah, of this one specifically? Yeah, so um, so with Network Analyst, you can calculate drive time to a facility, and it takes into account the road network that you have. So I use the Homeland Security Infrastructure Project data, which is a um, federal DHS-specific data set that has information on all of the major roads, minor roads, highways, et cetera, and it calculates the fastest drive time. Um, I'm not well-versed on the nitty-gritty of the inside of that machine. Um, but the basic idea is it'll give you a polygon corresponding to drive time. So for example, with this one, and I know it's hard to see because Texas is a different state, but for this one, this white area is the polygon in which you can drive to that TRC in 20 minutes or less. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll just throw in that I know it, you know, we have a end according to this size of this variable, but it might be easier to interpret if you have you know, an availability so, you know, 20 minutes is more available, that would be darker. Mm, that's a good idea. Um, that's a good because idea. The, I think one of the things that we're looking at going you know, scratching our heads is mm -hmm. why is it light in the middle? Mm. It's usually less of something. Mm. Okay. So, I appreciate that. Did you say network analysis? Network analysis is the one that I use. Okay. So that's okay. Yeah. Any other questions on this first step? So the second step is to look at population types. Um, and here I was looking at social vulnerability as I um, explained before. Social vulnerability, the data set that I had was by census tract. So I imported those as a polygon and converted them to a raster and then reclassified them into three groups, high, medium, and low vulnerability. Again, these breakpoints were a bit arbitrary. Um, I picked them out of convenience and I think if you were to do this again, you'd want to look more closely, perhaps looking at 
a number of studies about social vulnerability to the term risk for trans molecules. So for that same uh, same disaster, we can see these are the different vulnerabilities. Red here indicates high vulnerability. Yellow is medium. Uh huh. Yeah. So. Sorry. No, no, no. I love it. I love it. It's. It means that I'm going in a logical order. If you can tell where I'm going. Yes. Where? What did those people in the comments have any insights That's a really good question. So DRCs aren't the only way that FEMA gets help to survivors. One, another method that FEMA gets help to folks is, I mean, they have like online resources and phone resources, but they also have disaster survivor assistant teams called DSA teams. And these are people who go out in the field, knock on people's doors and say, hey, are you okay? Can you need help? That's a good question though. This whole like, swath of counties right here, this doesn't have any. Is that very low population? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's not as high population. I mean, these are major metro areas. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So, anticipating all of your questions. Um, so, the, the third step is to combine these pieces of information with the actual population counts. So, I combined the rasters um, from the first and second steps, so the drive time and the vulnerability. Um, to create a grid code that indicated the, both the DRC number, so which specific DRC that geographic area is closest to, the drive time, and the social vulnerability grouping. Um, so I'm sure there's a better way to do this than just adding up rasters that were converted from polygons, um, but this was the, the easiest way that I could think of off the top of my head. So then I converted these rasters back to a polygon, and then I used zonal statistics to count the land scan population. So land scan, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, is a really cool data set that came out of um, Oak Ridge Laboratories, I think, and has just really, really, it's a fine raster um, that shows population estimates with so much more detail than you could get from the census. Because census tracts, especially in a lot of these places in Texas, census tracts are huge. And so that's not going to give you the granularity of detail that you want, especially with these polygons you can imagine are kind of small. You're getting down to the level of high vulnerability people within 20 minute drive of a specific TRC. Does this sort of make sense, this raster to polygon to zonal statistics thing? It's a bit of a convoluted approach. But... Okay. And then the final step is to aggregate that data as you see fit. So for example, the row that I'm showing at the top of this Grid code 201 corresponds to DRC ID 0, which means all of the DRCs together, drive time 20 minutes, and I think for this, one was the most vulnerable people. So here you can see that there are 900,000 high vulnerability people within a 20 minute drive time of any DRC. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I mean, your, your methodology seems I don't think we should we have to go back to Polygon. Mm -hmm. We have to, have to do the zonal statistics. So, yeah, I don't, I don't see yeah, it. You don't, you don't have to put the state of Alaska. You have to put statistics. still. Could you do statistics with two rasters? So, what I the problem I was bumping up against is I didn't know how to do aggregate statistics for the land scan data, which was a raster, using the classifications from a from another raster. Being the um, combined drive time. And yeah, we have a sample of one. Okay. okay. But at least it, it doesn't give you either slippers or finest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we actually resampled one. Yeah. Yeah, so you take the resolution of one raster and you say the resolution of the other raster is bigger. And this one is resampled, so it matches the so landscan is one kilometer mm -hmm. spacing. So then is that what you use for yourself size or yeah. Yeah. You just use the 
but then the then I have reconverted them to a polygon, so I think there's definitely some active studies that they can happen there. With the difference between the polygon. So um, I went through this whole step, you know, had broken it into all of these cool polygons. You could see like exactly what the you know, vulnerability and the drive time was, put it all together, put it out, map, gave it to my boss, and she said, Heidi, that's the ugliest map I've ever seen. <laughs> and I said, you know what? You're not wrong. This map has way too much information, and you can't quite tell what's going on. But I just wanted to, to throw it out there so that you can get a sense of how much data this is. And I'll go through different ways that I've presented this data, not in map form, because I think it's more intuitive otherwise. Um, I think this has too many colors to be of use, frankly. Um, but the idea here is that you can see, so for example, um, this county is largely medium vulnerability to people who are all obviously outside of an hour's drive. So it just gives you an intuition. And if you zoom in, it might be more helpful, but I sort of shied away from using maps in the final analysis for this reason. That's all. So the fourth step um, then is to visualize this in a better way. A lot of folks, as I mentioned before, are a little bit uncomfortable with GIS um, or uncomfortable with statistical analyses. I actually had someone call it black magic once. They were like, what, what are you working on? I was like, oh, I'm using, I'm using math. And they were like, ah, oh, black magic, that stuff's cool. <laughs> OK, let's get it together, team. Um, so one challenge that I faced was finding a format that felt familiar and useful to my audience. Um, and as I mentioned before, an eventual goal with this is to create a standard suite of products that we tornado hits, then we know that we can, within 48 hours, output one of these maps. So this is the map that I showed you guys before. Hopefully, you have a little bit more context to understand it. Um, this shows the breakdown by vulnerability for um, disaster 40 to 23. So we can see that. For all people, about a quarter of the folks are within a 20 minute drive. Um, for high vulnerability people, over 50% of people are. Now, ideally, you would take this and compare it against some sort of goal or some sort of metric that you have to use. You could say, for example, we want 70% of high vulnerability people to be able to get there in 20 minutes or something like that. So that's the ultimate utility. These alone um, show part of the picture, but to compare them against some sort of standard would ultimately give you more. My department was working on developing that standard with a so hopefully this will be more useful for them in the future. Does anybody have any questions about this? Yeah. Now, as you know, GIS and some of but couldn't you have made the size on the map? Yeah. Did you do this on Excel? Yeah. I made this in Excel, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you definitely. So sort of imagining having yeah, like so five over here. Pie, each one of those areas would be yeah. that high yeah. on the map showing that county. Mm. Yeah, you certainly could do that. I had to do that. Just got there about two trains and everything, just like that. Yeah, yeah. just like too much. <laughs> it's too much for that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's true too. It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. yeah this, I mean, yeah. this is a nice, just a wall. Yeah, it's nice to look. Look. yeah. In addition, the way that I set up the data allows you to drill down at a deeper level. So this shows for the entire disaster. Now, if I'm a DRC manager trying to figure out what to do with Houston, this isn't going to be helpful because I don't care about the weird quote on county all the way out there. It's throwing off my head. Maybe, maybe I do. Sorry, maybe I care very deeply, but it's less relevant to my professional objective. Um, so you can also. Uh, we have two questions, which are global questions. Mm -hmm. One is: Is social vulnerability appropriate for mm -hmm. And the second question is: Did they do a good job? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the first question, I don't have an answer to. I'm saying, I think this might work, and I don't have any evidence to back that up. Um, but to the second claim. That's, that's what this project is focusing on. So you can also drill this down to the level of individual DRC. So this is for Leonardo Castillo Community Center in Houston. And you see that you expect sort of a similar breakdown between vulnerabilities or people who are within the catchment area of this DRC. And you can see that of the high vulnerability people who are within an hour of, these, of this DRC, so these are all the 
high vulnerability people who are most likely to go to this DRC based on drive time alone. A huge portion of them are within 20 minutes. So this might give a DRC manager a sense of what type of people they expect to see walking through their doors. And again, social vulnerability index has a lot more granularity than you're seeing here. So you could break this down by how many non-native English speakers am I expecting to come through the door? And then you can adjust the type of staff that you have for this DRC. And you could do this for every DRC in your disaster or any potential DRC site, more importantly, that you're considering. Does anybody have any questions about the individual DRC teams? Okay. Um, and then the last graph that I want to show you guys is this population by drive time. Um, and the idea with this was sort of to get a sense of what the overall shape of the graph was so we can get a sense of how these things are spread. So you can see that for this example, and again, this is that same Texas disaster, um, the 50th percentile drive time for high vulnerability people is much less than it is for other people. And depending on your priorities, depending on whether that's what you're going for or not, this could show a really solid place. However, I also want to point out, you see this huge uptick right here. That means that there's a lot of folks outside of a 60 minute drive. And that, as we pointed out, corresponds to that the county is really, really far away from the DRC. Maybe that's important for this disaster. Maybe it's not. Maybe they didn't have as much damage, or maybe there's DSA teams there. Um, so this graph, again, and it tells part of the story. So there's a policy element here. The scheme of making decisions can be that's a great question. So what you probably have detected here is that if they have a criteria by county, say there's not enough people in this county to do this, but you're activating all of these counties and say, well, put them all together, there are enough yeah. people to be concerned. Yeah, so it's a little bit sticky in that sense in that FEMA makes decisions on a disaster level basis, oftentimes. But DRC are requested on a county level basis. Um, and one thing that I think is really important, an important reason to develop this type of analysis is to push back against the people who say, we don't need one in our county. You can say that, yeah, but there's a lot of people on the edge of that other county who have nowhere to go, and there's no place to So the, the question of aggregation and what we're looking at is definitely important. And you could also imagine, I showed you guys the graphs for the you know, Community Center, you could also imagine breaking out by county instead of by DRC to show county level emergency management. What type of Especially for contrast, this is a disaster around this same time that occurred in Oklahoma, just north. And you can see the shape is very different. The 90th percentile is within a 60 minute drive um, and it flattens off at the end. So most people are within a 60 minute drive. Perhaps. So there are a ton of um, explanations. And it's, doesn't necessarily indicate that this placement of DRCs is any better or any worse than the other one. So maybe that it's very different. It often tends to change. Yeah, they were both or tornado, flooding. flooding, straight line winds. This this disaster in Oklahoma, if I remember correctly, was largely concentrated in small regions. So you had a higher population density, and it was spread over less time. So there were fewer Necessarily about flooding from data, I think it's a Yeah, yeah, oftentimes these things tend to be sort of unfortunate. Yeah, the way disasters are sorted in the Did you have a question? Yeah, would there be enough like, to store disaster data? To be, if, if the if FEMA came to you and said we have funding for eight DRCs mm -hmm. in Texas, mm -hmm. how many people have filled them? Like, is there enough historic like, disaster data that you can find this kind of data to be able to say you should get the DRC at, at, at this ring that long? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's saying regardless of what type of disaster it is? Yeah. So, yes, there's a lot of data going back to. I mean, the really good records are from like 2008, but going back to 2001 of different types of disasters, which means that in areas frequented by these types of disasters, like Texas, you do have a lot of that information. Oftentimes what they do, the way they go about it now is say, oh, we had a disaster in Houston, we put one here, we'll do that again. Um, so it's a little bit fuzzier. Yeah. How 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that could point out two things. One that could point out is social vulnerability a useful metric to be looking at? And two, how how do these placements compare to past past placements, or how could we compare future placements? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a really good question. So um, FEMA works with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency to get damage assessments. Um, and NGA, a lot of it's automated, but some of it's by hand. So like, sometimes you have to wait really up to four or six days to get complete damage assessments back, um, which is a vast improvement from how it used to be done, which was going out in the field, counting buildings that were broken. Um, it took a long time, it's not very effective. So yes, I think ultimately if you can incorporate, because I just did raw population, and not everyone in the city of Houston was affected equally by this disaster. Um, so if you could increase the damage, that would be a huge. So a couple additional applications of this, you could look at a number of different variables. And I wanna stress again, I picked DRCs and social vulnerability out of convenience and personal interest. There are a number of different ways you could use the same framework. So for example, FEMA gives out individual assistance grants for folks for anything from, like I said before, funeral costs to fixing your roof, and you can look at how those are distributed. So instead of using landscape and population data, you would look at assistance registrations or grant distributions. You can also use this type of model for allocating shelters, for allocating um, distribution centers for food and water, those sorts of things. Um, and one question that I'm particularly interested in, in the future is how do we foster greater integration of disaster recovery centers and the DSA teams that I mentioned before, which are the teams that go out to people's houses and see if they're registered or what type of support team. Because currently those two <laughs> Um, so I said at the beginning that my goal was to build the FEMA tool where you put in all the information that says, hey, put DRCs here. As you can see, that's not what I did. I did it in the opposite direction. I said, if you want to put a DRC here, how good is the location? So my hope by working this problem backwards in a sense is to leave FEMA with a starting place or a basic tool or a framework that they can then use to create this type of um, for those of you who care, I scripted it in Python. Python is my new best friend. Uh -huh. Really, I, I just really am blown away by the power of this technology, and I think it's vastly underutilized, particularly at FEMA, but um, in other places. Um, so I'd like to end this with a little bit of gratitude to folks at FEMA um, for incredible to me over the summer. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I'd like to also share a little bit about why disaster management is so important. So this is a picture of my dog. Um, and a picture of what used to be the field across from my house. My house was luckily unscathed by the Colorado floods, um, but definitely hit home. And what's most important about this analysis, no matter how you cut it, is that you're helping people's lives improve and you're helping improve the recovery time of survivors in the field. So these aren't just you know a bunch of raster pixels, these are people's lives that you're making better. And that's ultimately why I see this technology is so thank you. Happy to answer questions. There's also still cookies in the back. If anybody wants more, I wouldn't be offended if you got up. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I, like I said before, I'm so grateful to have an opportunity to chat with GIS people about this, like geek out about the last did you leave them at FEMA with your scripts and a way to run those on, say, if they want to run those in different areas, or, or did it go that far? Yeah, so I left them with all of the code that I wrote, all commented in my final report and everything. Um, and on the last day, my boss came up to me and said, Heidi, this is this is really, really great code that you wrote here. really like it. And he sort of leans in and like, does, like, uh, the, on my desk and look at it. does like the, he does the awkward lean and he goes, Hi, did you have anybody else who can run this? <laughs> also, this looks like a really great master's project. I'm just saying you should come right back. So high hopes, but I'm not sure how well it'll be. Well, it'll be used. Absolutely. FEMA's is particularly strange in that regard in that FEMA's divided into 10 regions across the US. 
So I worked in the headquarters, but Region 8, which is Colorado, slays at this stuff. <laughs> like they have like eight people. They have, they like, did these really cool regression models for Sandy about like water levels and stuff. Um, and then like Massachusetts has this one dude, his name's Chad, he's really awesome. But like, there's a real big uh, discrepancy between. So you, you got the locations of DRC from the REST service, mm -hmm. which means they're running some web server, yeah. GIS server or something. Yeah. It means there is some level of expertise, but that was probably in one of their offices perhaps, or it yeah. was kind of national. Yeah, I think it might've been also a bit of a legacy system that had been from the, the DRC folks before. Yep. <laughs> 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 Definitely, definitely. And I think one one obstacle that I bumped up against that I was surprised by in this work is um, sort of a, an ethos of disaster management that like, you haven't you haven't been in the field, you don't know what it's like. This sort of um, you don't know it because you haven't been there. And so I think it's important to take this work with a grain of salt and go to humility because I haven't been there. I didn't set up DRCs after Katrina, so I don't know what it's like. And I'm just trying to build tools to make those people's lives easier. Well, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the emergency management point. Let's find technology that helps us work out better, recognizing that none of it will actually work. <laughs> yeah, you had another question? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so some of it is public knowledge. The um, Pima just rehauled, like overhauled their websites, so I'm not exactly sure where it's located now. Um, DRC data might not be available on aggregate. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I don't. Know what you're yeah. I had. Yeah. I had. <laughs> Excel. Um, and this I um, did for 10 minute increments. So instead of doing uh, 20, 40, 60, I re ran it in 10 minute increments without the breakdown by individual DRC. It doesn't have to taking too long to run. Um, there's a sort of difficulty with the case in that mm. you don't know the actors mm. of either of them. Yeah, so absolutely. You don't know if the social vulnerability corresponds to actual need. And you don't know if over time, or in any particular instance, FEMA chose well. Mm -hmm. for yeah, absolutely. So, what would be very interesting towards making a site selection tool would be to look at actual mm -hmm. um, if you get the infrastructure damage uh, and the claims, mm -hmm. and the claims of every distribution, yeah. the centers, then you could use that as, as a ground truth yeah. to compare the other two things against. Yeah, absolutely. So, there are two, two main things that I think you could compare it against really well is registration. Um, and visits to actual DRCs. So if I say that you know there are a million people in this catchment area, folks have told me that about 10% of the people in the circle that they on the map compared to the idea actually come. So we can see sort of if those line up and if but that- you have to get consistent. their locations. Yeah. Not just the Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that FEMA has um, that as an intern I didn't have access to because Never found the answer to the questions like this is that the statistical stuff that you have doesn't take into account things like the political and the context of the in a rural area, the big one town that has infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that they know that the library in that town is a good place. Yeah. Transportation networks can help with that. So, but you can still show whether it was a neutral. Yes, yeah, so that's the only so far is if you can come up with a model. If you have a metric for. Yeah. It was a nice yeah. library, but it was. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was 
Yeah. If you have a metric for what good looks like, yeah. which I think is is a bigger problem that I bumped up against. That I was like, what's a good site? And they were like, ah. Oh, mm, well, that's why. Let's <laughs> <laughs> some regressions on various factors. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. I'll stick around here in the minute and answer other people's questions if you want. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come.